Welcome to the Human Broadcheck Podcast. Here we have inspiring stories worth spreading. I am your host, Karina Rosa Feikenberg. <laughs> Welcome, my dear. Ah, hi, it's been great to compartire with you. <laughs> ah, it's my pleasure. Who are you? Well, I guess I'm a soul that's in transformation. And I'm amazed of what things we can do and create in life and keep on and live in the earth or bring it with us into wherever, if it's heaven or air. I don't know. <laughs> I love that. How would your daughter, she was just passing by, beautiful young woman, how would she describe her mother? I think she uh, the most loving mother. She's mm -hmm. told me that from all the mothers she knows. Oh, sweet. <laughs> the most um maybe pushing her forward sometimes she would get sick like oh stop pushing me i had to go to talk to someone because i shouldn't be with you i, I shouldn't be like you because you're always having high expectations on yourself so i would say that uh, i'm intense in that way like to get the best out of life or getting water out of a rock mm -hmm. So probably it's been a little hard on her in that sense. Uh, but I think she's capable of many things. And in school, she had examples of other ways of thinking. So I didn't want that to influence her more in her adolescence. Why are the two of us right now here sitting on this lovely deep red sofa? Well, I guess like it's a connection that we... I don't know. I guess that we met a few days ago and it just was the energy and we kept on like in circles with the energy and we're here talking. <laughs> I remember when I saw you the first time, it was amazing because you have such a presence that it is like room capturing. And I thought, I have to talk to this beautiful woman. So I was very happy when we met a couple of days later and now I'm sitting here in your beautiful studio apartment. It's an amazing place. You're an artist. And looking around now in your home, it's, I can discover so much, so much, like there's a lot of energy in here, not just colorful energy, but it's also like hidden colorful energy. It's not too full. You have a lot of white space and class and we look out and see the volcanoes and the mountains. What is your most preferable piece of art here and why? I guess that the The whole piece, which is like made out of, uh, I would say, 10 pieces now, mm -hmm. is in the dining room. Mm -hmm. The background is black and there's portraits of different women, native women mm -hmm. from all of Latin America. And they're embroidered and they all tell the story of all, all of us women. So I think the energy is like kind of conflictive, but... I need to put them out there. It's like my energy in a hole. Mm. So I think that's my favorite piece of art. They look amazing and I'm right now looking at them. How would you describe um, the artwork to those who cannot see them right now? How could they imagine what you have created? I think it's a portrait of a native woman dressed like a queen. Mm. And even if at the time of the conquest, because they are in that, it's supposed to be from that in the 1500s, but they're contemporary pieces. They're photographs that are embroidered with from plastic to gold in their dresses and their crowns. And I took the um, history in the um, conquest of Latin, um, Latin America and the Caribbean. And instead of making these women that were conquered by Portuguese and Spaniards, Uh, instead of making them victims, I have made them queens because I admire women and I admire and uh, something that has been taken for granted is that where do Latin Americans come from and actually are from probably foreign men and native women. I, of course, there's some that stayed within their brothers and sisters and husbands, but mostly all the Latin American men and women were born to 
not mestizos, but Ladinos, it's called here in Guatemala, are mm -hmm. a mixed race. And uh, they were the real women. Those are the first women that made the Latin Americans. And since story, history is told mostly by men, we've taken this for granted. And I, when I was young, I went to the marketplace with my mother and I would see these beautiful native women, all these grandmothers selling their foods. And I would say, these are wonderful women. Look at their faces and their personality. But people are like, well, yeah, they're just selling fruits. And no, they're much more than that. I need to put them as queens. History was told out from the perspective of men. When I entered the room here, the dining room, I was like really, wow, captured by those women. They all look at you. They're amazing. And I think it's exactly that what you said. They look like queens. Getting out of the victim role, would you have one story of one of your women portrays there that you would like to share? What happened to one of those stories, maybe in a couple of short works, and why could you turn them from victimhood into queenshood? Okay, well, the one that's really decisive in this decisive moment, mm -hmm. actually I made this in a screenplay also because I'm mm -hmm. a filmmaker, is the moment, and uh, well, I'm talking about the screenplay, but I'm going to go back to the woman and Okay, the woman that I probably want to tell the story, it's not that I admire her most, but really the story is, this is a woman that was not okay in her tribe, and uh, she got, um, this Spaniard had her as a present, can you imagine? But the Spaniard treated her so well, better than the same people in her tribe, that they fell in love, and the moment that she had it, child she really didn't know if she was going to root for her native brothers and sisters or for the father of her son so I think the moment that women give birth is a decisive moment so what your destiny will be because of course if her tribe, even if they were treating her well or not, or the other tribe or whatever. But if she's from that tribe, I'm saying tribe, but it's really not that word, but um, it's her blood and her cousins. But if they're losing the fight and you have a son and the father is the winner and the son is a mixed race, as a mother, what do you choose for your son? Mm. Because in a second, if you choose wrong, he's dead. Mm. So for me, it was a decisive moment in history. And it's all about women. Women, they play an important role. When I was now walking here in your, again, amazing home, I could see it has this feminine energy. I love feminine energy. <laughs> you are a very feminine woman. Mm. Yeah, when I saw you, like you play with long, long jewelry chains, long hair, um, the dresses you are wearing, it's very, very feminine. I think I would even say that you are in your full femininity. femininity. That's the right <laughs> word, right? Have you ever been like this in this complete female energy? I actually have this new energy that before I was probably trying to be feminine. Mm. But now that I have my masculine and my feminine balanced, mm. Because I have learned how to be the provider for myself. I think I am so... This happened because of what I say. So you got divorced, right? And you had three kids. Yes. Mm -hmm. I got divorced, had three, had three kids. But I played a lot of housewife and entrepreneur in my own things and artist. And I was always very much involved in my work. But I was feminine in the sense of being mother, a mother, mm -hmm. the perfect mother and the perfect wife. Mm. and keeping up with myself. But now that I'm also, mm. I divorced, and now I am the man in my life, although I have another man in my life, <laughs> but I take care of my own finances, I feel so secure of myself that I feel my femininity is even mm. growing more because I have my own root and I am the leaves in the tree. 
but I have my own route within myself. I don't need to be flying somewhere and saying yes just because I need to be supported or approved by someone. And I have a new partner that he loves me deeply for who I am. And I don't need to prove him anything. So it's very interesting what I've learned now in my life. So there was all a kind of transformation. There was a process hin towards, maybe to summarize if I find the right word, empowerment at the end, fully empowerment. Yes, and sometimes I use that word sometimes, mm -hmm. but um, when I mentor other women in their mm -hmm. business and on their personal life, when I mention empowerment, they get scared and they're like, I don't want to use that word. But actually it is an empowerment, but it's a beautiful soul empowerment and it's not empowerment powers over anybody else is just a sense of peace within yourself and for me that's empowerment mm. this is so beautiful because just yesterday i had a talk with someone and we also got to the conclusion that this peace within oneself yes. gives makes a completion of a personality so for me personally it's not nice to hear exactly the same words that's i amazing. learned so much in this podcast <laughs> it's like amazing so what's your best advice how Can one find peace within oneself? Not needing anything or not needing anything from anybody. Like if you can provide it with your own energy and your own hum humility. And what I mean with humility is like accept all the gifts that you were born with. And for that, you have to take all these beliefs that people put into your brain and go into your own intu intuition and see what you're good for. Mm -hmm. What would you do even if they wouldn't pay you for? And that is really your real talent, what you enjoy in life. And see if you can make money or stand on your own with that and just accept who you are, even if it's millions or if it's something just to eat from. So I think when you accept that and you can live off of that and then you can um, also accept who you are, woman or man, and see what you're good for and what you're not and just, it's, it's okay. And then go with the flow. It's funny because the Christians say, Go in the river of life of Jesus Christ, but it's really go in the flow of the energy of life. And for me, God is that energy. Are you yourself religious? I am not religious. I'm just connected to the energy. Mm -hmm. And I do feel that when you get connected into that intention and you don't listen to your crazy talks and stupid beliefs that distract you thinking of the past and the future and the should ofs or should I do, I think that That is the key to step yourself into that energy and just flow with it. So I do believe in that. And when you flow with it, miracles happen. And for me, that's God. So it's not really a religion. It's just, just flowing with the congruence in yourself. To what extent, Veronica, could you flow with life, with this international lifestyle? You, you told me before where you had homes or apartments. And that you're going, I think, next Sunday already to Europe, to Madrid. What is home and to what extent is a static home in alignment with the flow of life? You know, I had an issue with home since I was born. Because I didn't have the best childhood. So it's funny because we haven't really talked about that. But um, this curator that curated my art book, which is like 300 pages, she's like... Homes are everywhere in your art because I missed a home for myself when I was young and I put a mission in my life to have the best home for my kids mm -hmm. and for my partner in my life and to feel comfortable telling a story and not feeling like you want to leave your home. Mm -hmm. So in, I also built a lot of homes. So home at the end is really within you. I learned that building all these homes and giving a wonderful home for my kids. And when I divorced, I said, oh, my God, my home. And actually, I had to work on this. And I realized that my home was where I was. And even if I, um, my kids have two homes now, I am very proud to say that the home that I built 
emotionally was very warm for my kids and beautiful and everything they had. But I was half my husband and half me. And he was a wonderful man, but in certain ideas that are important for me in my life, like about God and energy and uh, spirituality, we didn't share the same thing. So keeping in that home would have been damaged for my kids in my mm -hmm. responsibility with my beliefs. So now that we split, he has his own um, spirituality and I respect it, but I do have my own And also the, the kids see these both places and they can choose in the middle, in one side or the other. But at least I now know that my home now in my heart is more real than the home that I mm -hmm. dreamed of before. So it's interesting also how your home transforms when you go into the maturity of your spiritual connection. Mm -hmm. And Very well said. So oh. the end you transform this, what you have materialized as a home and you wanted to keep into something that is within your heart so home is at the end everywhere still looking around i mean your home is so special all those beautiful things they're material things but not just because i can see so many lovely art pieces yeah it's also one part of home right what happens when you open the door here when you come back from europe in a couple of months and you open the door here What kind of feeling do you think you're going to have then? It's very special. I feel that the walls are hugging me. And that's why, you know, I have this apartment and it's the way it is. Because I feel that when I come here, I don't need to leave anywhere mm -hmm. for a long time. I mean, if the world explodes or the pandemic comes again, I lived here so happily that I was so glad I didn't have my mind jumping into where am I going to go now because I was so safe. So it's a hug and safety and everything that's on the walls, if I change it or not, it's just a reflection of myself. It could be of my past, but still it's a good past. So it's like, it, it's like familiar. It's my own home that I put in the walls is reflecting to myself. Could you have this kind of radical approach in life to give up? that space for example and just to live in a small empty apartment because you would feel so homey in your heart that you could say this is sufficient or would you say no there's still some part of me which i think would be fine and maybe i'm even looking myself for where you could say no i need to have my things arranged my personal belongings here and there and i can assume when you walk around here you find in each piece in each object certain history that is connected to it so to what extent does this play a role Well, it's funny because I've been experimenting that mm -hmm. because I usually had homes that had my same feeling mm -hmm. and special decoration and I would go and feel like, oh, mm -hmm. but I, I was fearful of that when I separated because we had to mm -hmm. dissolve some homes. But I realized that I could live very simply and I make a world of its own once I get there. The only thing that's important... So you will recreate. Yes, totally. That. Recreate. Love that. And actually, maybe I'm not going to go buy artwork or make artwork because usually it's mine. I don't really need it because I know it's temporary. If I would live there for a long, long time, maybe, yes, I start to put the prints on, my, on the walls and on the everything. But what's really important is location and light. Yeah, for me as well. And a bed, a good bed. <laughs> it has to be a good bed. If it's a bad bed, I could die. And that's why sometimes in Airbnbs or if I rent an apartment okay, for months. Okay, I have to take the bed in. But what I'm definitely with is this light. Right now the sun is going down. I, which floor are we in? This is 16. It's amazing because the view is really going through the, out to the end, to the volcano and the mountain line. And the soft light going everywhere in this apartment, it's amazing. It's one of those spaces where I think you can just lock yourself in for weeks and you will not get bored. Exactly. That's why you can look. I made my home with my kids was all windows inside a forest. Mm. And when I built this one, because I built it from scratch, I could do the two floors. I was like one ear inside the plants, making sure that everywhere you put your eyes, there was a space to look 
through mm -hmm. and where the only place I couldn't do it, I have that, um, the new geography that's a mountain that's also doing the mountains like this. So it's so refreshing to be able to feel you're in the air because this is like a house in the clouds. Mm -hmm. So it's important. A house in the clouds. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You haven't seen the second floor, but it's no, like, it, it has like that uh, from the room wow. and the doors open like that. It's, not it's so good door. to reach out to the, because we have so much crowning energy because we're walking the whole day, right? Mm -hmm. So I love it. I always like when, when I move or when I choose for an appointment or a place, I want it to be in the top. I love yes. it. Yes. So it feels so airy and freedom. What was your definition of home? You said before, like when you grew up, it was a bit challenging, your family background. Do you remember how home felt at that point of time? You said also that you wanted to give to your kids, you wanted to provide them with everything that you thought is required for a good, warm, loving home, right? Mm -hmm. So again, how was it when you were younger and you came home from school, after school? How did it feel? Lonely. There was no one there. Mm. So for me, uh, it's funny I oh, mention it. Oh, skin when you say that. For me, um, when I would get out from the bus, would come running down and asking, who said home, who said home? And I had a nanny and she said, no, and they just left. So I felt like, why did they just leave? Why didn't wait for me for five minutes? I don't, don't judge anybody now because mm -hmm. I know everybody had their own problems or situations. And you, when you're young, you take it like, why me? I'm not worth it. That's really the message. So it's incredible, but... Every day, almost every day that my kids would wake up or would come back from school, I was there. I needed to look into their eyes or to say, are you okay? Everything okay from school? And it was just like hugging myself, mm. like hugging them was hugging myself. Of course, they were born like that. They don't really see the difference. But I know I did the difference for myself because they were my mirror. So it's incredible, and I realize now, you know, it's like I don't expect really much from them because they grew up in such a loving environment. But I realized that I was hugging myself when I had those three miracles in my life. And now the funny thing is sometimes we are longing for something, and then we have our own kids, and then we see maybe they didn't have had the need, or for them it was too much, or oh, they just see it differently. When you speak now with your kids about how they felt about home. How was it for them? How would, they, how would they describe home from their perspective? And again, I think it's so interesting because it's just a different perspective, right? Yes. Um, what would you say? It's funny because, of course, they grew up knowing what they know. Mm -hmm. So they don't know there's terrible things. <laughs> so I think they grew up in... Uh, it sounds awful. No, no, it doesn't sound awful. It sounds like pretentious, but it's not. They grew up in a perfect home, but all, there's never perfection, right? No, luckily, no. Uh, no. It would be boring. But they really know now comparing with their friends and other people, they come and they tell me, Mom, now I realize what a great mom you were. You're always there and you're still there for me. And um, now I know what you gave up and giving us all that time. The funny thing is that sometimes now that they are grown ups and they're doing their own business, they I'm here at home and I'm doing my things because I work and I have my own life and they interrupt me and they're like, I need this right now. And I'm like, I can't give it to you right now. And they get upset because when they were young, yeah, it was they, like they were the prince and yeah. the princesses. And it was like, yes, now I was actually... But this Two. is a change for them then as well, oh, right? Course. Oh, wow. So mommy is not 24-7 available. Exactly. And, uh, you know, I tried to be because it's like they're used to it. But it took me a while in this transformation to tell them, no, you have to wait. And I had butterflies in my stomach feeling guilty Good. of putting limits. So I had to grow up and say, no, now they also is good for them to know that I overgave so it wasn't perfect. I overgave that love. So now I'm taking a little back and saying, no, 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 this is the normal. Because, you know, I had like, I probably, the love that I wanted to get in my home, I got from my kids mostly also. So I overgave them probably certain attention. So, and that's important to realize. It's very hey, conscious to say that. Wow, you're a mother. Yes. And you say that, wow. <laughs> yes. And consciously, I realized I compensated mm -hmm. 
mm. for certain situations I had in my own life, giving them so much. I felt so good because it was my reflection of myself, like hugging them. How can you deal with that? Um, your daughter just passed away, uh, passed by here. <laughs> no, 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 she's not passed away. <laughs> We're passed, passed walking yeah, away. Passed walking a bit. <laughs> no, I have to apologize. Maybe no, no, because no, no. it was a bit like with this no, conver- no. conversation we have before. So she left and she's now living in Mexico City, right? Mm-hmm. And then the other two, they are in Europe, mm-hmm. in Madrid. Mm-hmm. How is it for you to let go of your kids and to not have them around then 24-7? Yes. Well... Actually, I worked in the United States and I would come and go sometimes when there were teenagers. And I know that freedom of making it internationally and not only in this country where probably you grow up with a society and you have safe, your job is safe and they know who you are. So the challenge of knocking on doors on your own, being nobody Mm. and making it, it is so wonderful to build this relationship with people that are not from this society and don't judge. So that pleasure made me into what I am. So I think they have to experiment it. And I think they have to know that they are people that can survive in Mars or in Russia or in Japan, Mm -hmm. not in a country where they have it all. So for me, this is important. You never know what happens in the world. And uh, knowing that you did these things in certain places gives you the knowledge and the security of doing better things in your life. And it's trans- transforming. So my daughter's doing her own business on her own totally. My son is doing his own thing on a job that nobody knew him. And my other son is a musician. And here it's not really where we grew up, a country for artists. I am an artist. But he is, he's been doing his music for six years, believing in himself, even if he studied entrepreneurship and he's a great businessman or whatever, but he wants to do his music. So he left to Madrid because it's more open and there's more opportunities. So he's giving it a try and I'm there mentoring him. Go ahead, go ahead. You so you approve this. this. Definitely. Not so at the end, it's also like this thing about proximity and distance, right? Yes. Every relationship needs that. Yes. Also the children ones when it comes to vis-a-vis the mother and also your own relationship. Yes. Well, now is the moment of not proximity with the mother because they have to grow up. And you know what? I understood that a mother has to break mostly with men, the umbilical cord for them to be grown-ups. If not, they always have that image of the mother mothering them. And of course, when they're in need of something like desperate, they call me even if it's at two o'clock in the morning and I'm there to answer, but not really. But um, they they have come uh, with girlfriends, both have girlfriends, my boys. And I know that for men, it's important to respect their mother and adore her dearly. But I know that there's going to be a woman in their life that's going to give them more than the mother. And I have to step back. And I've understood this. And my daughter also, she needs her space on me not judging whatever she does or not with the boyfriend. I can guide her and mentor her if she asks. But I have to learn how to step back. How do you do it in your relationship? I mean, I think you're a very modern woman, very a free spirit, which I personally appreciate a lot. (laughs) So how can you keep up with this distance, closeness, um, as a woman, now you go on your own, firstly on your own to Madrid for the next two months. How can you find the good line in giving confidence to your partner that you will be there, but you need that space to develop, to grow, to expand, and also maybe to discover new pieces that you then incorporate in your art, because you are an artist, so you need to digest the new as well. Well, first I think, The moment my partner for five years met me, um, he knew that I was a filmmaker because that's where he met me. And um, he knew I was traveling a lot. But he also knows my soul. We're very, very intimate. That's very important to me. And that's a commitment I have. And I think he feels that. Um, If he's insecure sometimes... It's just, I'm a call away, I'm there, and my conversation is 
the same as I, if I had left the day before. There's no like, oh, I cannot talk to you because I'm busy. I mean, I'm really there. So I think he has learned through these years that I'm always there. And if there's not a big deal happening or we have a huge fight, we talk and he knows I'm reachable to talk. So you give him priority even when you're oh, not yeah. physically there? You give him priority, which of course creates confidence. Yes. Mm -hmm. And he knows. It, he has to feel it because he's the priority right now. I, I really love having a man in my life. And um, uh, I feel confident that our love is very profound and our intimacy for me is very important. And actually, there's nothing that really I would change for that intimacy. And, uh, of course, I need to do this trip. And if, um, if he would be really needy and makes a big deal out of it, I mean, he can come and be with me and he's always invited or me if I had to come and see him. Always there's a plane away. So there's no reason why we would have to have a fight or a mistrust. Can you sometimes, and if so, how, evaluate or feel the insecurities of the others. I think it's normal, right? Mm -hmm. You might feel in some aspects insecure. It's normal. It comes security, insecurity. It's always this kind of, 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 of change. How can you feel that your partner is maybe insecure? What do you do? Is it like also like a high grade of awareness or consciousness? What happens when you're not next to him, not physically in the same space? How can you make sure that everything is fine? Is it a gut feeling thing? Okay. Sometimes it's not fine, but I'm not a doctor. <laughs> This is the best answer. <laughs> This I love. <laughs> I love that. It's true. Sometimes. I love that. So you, it it's, it's a border. It's, it's a, here is the line. This is now your I pain. Because yes. everybody of us has feeling of neglect and whatever. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you say this is yours. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And it's like maybe at the beginning I was like, listen, you know, I want to give you security. I know you're feeling this and this. I know you miss me and everything, but I'm here. And uh, But sometimes people don't express what they're feeling and mm -hmm. they act strange. Yes. And it's confusing. I think everybody knows that, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's confusing. But then you're like, what's going on? What will he decide? What is happening? Why didn't he call? What? So you start playing like weird games. And then, to be honest with you, I just go like... Oh, here he is. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. We're talking about him. Hello, hola. <laughs> <laughs> hola, hola. So um, I think um, that I've learned how to not get red flags or insecurities on my own of him being strange or not talking too much. I like this. This is something which I really appreciate. I think a lot of us don't do this. They take it personal. It must be that it has to do something with me instead of mm -hmm. saying, this is you. Go and heal your wounds. Come back after or whatever. And sometimes mm -hmm. it turns into you and go like, no, you're the weird one. Why didn't you this? <laughs> yes. And I think you have to just calm down and be honest and say, you know, this is my mm -hmm. situation. I really love you. I this, let's come down. And not all the time it happens like this because I'm human, to be honest <laughs> with you. So sometimes good. I'm like, ah, and <laughs> hang up. But I have to own my own feeling, my own emotion, come down and say, listen, I don't want to break up. I'm here. I really love you. But it's also your decision. And we've done this a few times. You know, it's like I've come to that. And uh, saying, you know, I am here. If you believe it, great. And if not, you cannot also manipulate life because sometimes partners are not forever. You cannot hang on to something if the energy is not there. And sometimes you just have to bite it and say, breathe in and whatever happens has to happen. But you, for me, in my side, sometimes I over communicate. You over communicate? Sometimes. How does it look like? You explain a lot and a lot and a lot or... And a lot and it's kind trying to <laughs> fix it. Trying to fix But like I say, I'm not a doctor, but it comes to the point when I realize yeah. that if I didn't fix it fast, it's not going to be fixed because the other one has to give also. So if you're not understood, it's like the energy is not there. Mm -hmm. And it can be moments or the personality. 
And people have moments also. And then it's just patient and see what happens. But this is the problem with a lot of people. The expectations that you have on the other and the expectations of life and what life should be. Ciao. It's so much. The daughter, the beautiful daughter. <laughs> yeah. The expectation of what should be. It's so like a stick in your mind that that's a problem. You don't expect anything. Life will surprise you. And if something hurts, hug yourself and cry. It will hurt, but it'll pass. Detachment. That's a big thing in life. You can be detached to parts of your appointment, ideally, which is good. Or you can also have this kind of detachment to people, but in a positive way. Because I think everything that is attachment is also possessing. It tries to possess. How would you say was your curve of transformation in life, your learning pattern? When you now look back, you as you were at the age of 10, 15, towards the mature woman you are now. <laughs> the pattern, you mean? Yes. I was throwing myself into life and... Uh, so you were exploring life, I can yes. assume. Oh, yes. yes, exploring and really not being afraid. I was an adventurer, really. And then I was congruent and beautiful things happened to me. Opportunities since my first job, I worked for Miami Vice series. Mm, Remember really? that? Really? was my first job. And nobody What did you would. do there? I was a still photographer. I was, wow. the, write, I was the assistant writer mm -hmm. just out of the university of film school. So you did study film? Yes, I studied mm -hmm. film. And I took the... Nobody... Oh, you don't want to be an assistant to the writers. I had won <laughs> the, the best film in school. So they were like, no, you have to go and be a director. And I'm like, listen, I am not American. So I need to take advantage of my OPT when you're working in the States. So I'm going to take that job. Mm -hmm. And I took it and I made inside the best I could. I wrote two episodes while I was the wow. assistant. They bought it. I be went into the Writers Guild. Michael Mann, that's a very famous filmmaker, uh, came and talked to me and said, tell me about this political story. And then I went to be an art director in another of his films. And then I came back and they said, listen, we have photographers that are very old fashioned and they cannot photograph Don Johnson. And I was friends with Don Johnson for a film before when he wasn't <laughs> famous. And I was like, okay, I'll do it. And I started taking all the photographs so of cool. everybody. Yeah, yeah. And I, then I started, a gallerist came and said, you have to have an exhibition of this artwork in my gallery. And I did artwork for Miami Vice also, a certain, it's a long story. But so I was like this connected with all of these people. And then I went to Los Angeles and um, went to a master screenwriting master course. And I won a prize. And Kathleen Kennedy, which is the producer of Spielberg, gave me a prize on it. And then I was like, I need a home. How old were you when you asked yourself for I need 22. To wow. Okay. So, but I was there and I got like for working, I got like Epstein Barr, which was like kind of like immune system disease. I was overworked. And I said, I need my own home. And I came back home to Guatemala and to the surprise that my parents were divorcing and that I ended up living alone in this country, which is not an easy thing. It's a different society. But I got a job as a chief in a commercial company. And I started, um, you know, doing commercials and things on my own company. And I did um, uh, films for the Inwad, the tourism board and everything. And they were great. So I was getting paid really well. And I was successful for like four years. And then I met my hus ex-husband and then we got married. And I said... At what age did you marry? I, 28. 28, 29. And the first baby arrived. How old were you then? I lost my first baby oh. and I was freaked out. And then I think at 31. Sorry to hear. Yeah, at 31. Isabella came at 31. And when did you take up your artwork or your professional work then again? Oh. Because you said like, you became really like perfect housewife, perfect mother. Yes. You wanted to create that home for your kids. I mean, where was space for something else? Most probably not. It came maybe later? I built two houses in the moment when I got married. I built beautiful homes and my kids. And then... Two years and a half after I was married, um, I realized that I was like giving everything and all my life. And then that probably wasn't reciprocal. And my husband said, 
sense, not to say what happened, but something strong happened in a marriage. And I realized I had forgotten my life and my career. So I decided to do in my house, because I already had one, two kids, that I was going to keep on being a great mother and in the house, but I built a studio at home and I started doing my artwork. Mm. So I was like working the whole day and I never stopped. I'm a hyperactive, so I never stopped. So I was pitching my art everywhere and mostly in the United States, here in Guatemala and in the United States. And if you see in the internet my career, it's like I won biennials. I did incredible projects. I, um, you know, like 12 years later, I did the Mestiza project, but I did so, so many things. I was really productive, productive, and I never left my studio. I never left home. I'm not a friend person. Where is now, I have to ask, all this tremendous energy coming from? What's the source of this energy? Because sometimes I met people who, who are looking for a piece of that kind of energy that you were having. Where would you say, what is the origin? God spirituality it's like i was born this there's something special that i really think i have which i thank the creator i was born with these ideas that i can conceptualize and bring them to point and when they when i had my cards read i mean my horoscope it's like i'm a scorpio And I can do all these wonderful creative projects, but I have a very strong Capricorn, which is materialize them. So I'm very good at all these creative, incredible energy and ideas, and I can do them. And this is, I think, so important. Yeah. Because a lot of artists I know, they have the most beautiful ideas, but there is a tiny piece missing to put them into reality. Yes. And that I mentor people for that, not only their own life, personal lives, but also projects. It's like, okay, 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 let's do a line here and let's draw this so it becomes this. It's like an equation. So, uh, yes, I can do that. <laughs> how, how does it come that you surrender those people or humanity or humans then in general, you having such... Um, Again, this energy flow that I can also right now sitting with you still on this beautiful sofa, <laughs> feel you with all those different ways of expressing yourself. Then this sensuality that you are having, right? Which is, I think, a treasure. I think not many women have yet discovered that sensuality is so powerful, right? So what is you, you say you're mentoring other people, What is your idea about that? Do you say like, oh, I was so blessed by life, by God, whoever it was. I want to pass my knowledge on. I want to offer my help. Or what is your motivation behind that? Because you could also say, I'm just sitting here in those beautiful homes and look how the sun goes down. So where does this come from? I think I am so happy. Mm -hmm. And I am, it's funny that you mentioned the sensuality. But I'm right, right? Yes, And what it is, is I feel myself sensual. Like, I would like for women... You see, it comes all with the femininity and the womb. I love the womb. Yes. And it's what? It's something inside. It's, I, I don't want to say it wrong, but I feel fire in me. That, of course, I love to make love and mostly to my partner and an intimate... But I also feel that I'm always making love to myself. Ah. I know exactly <laughs> what you mean. So I'm walking this craziness for life. It's so beautiful. And it's an adventure. Yes, and, it is. And you know what? It, now I'm going to jump to my father, which is, uh, has nothing to do with sensuality, but my <laughs> father taught me how to feel a thrill of life. Mm -hmm. For example, I was like eight years old and he would take me to the Pacific Ocean in Guatemala and it's warm and he would say let's go just swim and we'll surf with our bodies don't be afraid and there's strong huge waves and I would do this with my dad but it was such a thrill I was so young I mean it's dangerous it's like you know just do it you can do it and it was I was like a little tomboy so I was doing all these thrilling things I would jump like parkour from 
not with my father, but, this, but from ceiling to ceiling, like parkour in the, in the buildings in the colony I lived. And I was always very sporty. So it's a mixture of adventure and competition that it's a thrill. So um, the part in competition I've changed because I, that was like an ego trip also, but now I'm like just with the flow. But yes, it's, um, I would love for women to feel that empowerment, which is the word that sometimes they don't like to hear because they, scare, they get scared. But this feeling about self-sufficiency mm -hmm. and of love of yourself. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean I'm not scared sometimes or some, I feel victim or whatever. You always feel things. But really, when I think about creating projects, for example, this is something I hadn't realized, but my boyfriend told me, listen, you are a work of art. And I'm like, what do you mean? There's not a moment that I ever see you that you're not creating. I cook for myself morning, middle day, and that. night. And I invent what I cook. So it's really like if I'm not moving or changing something or making something pretty or arranging something or creating or writing, I write screenplays, I'm writing a book, I'm writing a, sometimes I fill my mind with too many things. And sometimes I have to take it easy and not be in the mood of creating because you also have to perform or administrate things. And that's my male side now that I have to ground and say, okay, I need to administrate my finances, I need to... Okay, go to the accountant and pay, which I hate, but that's my grounding part that I've learned now how to do and with responsibility, not happiness. I love what you just said. Because <laughs> at the end, it's this creation is within everything you do. And I think you can make lovely ceremonies, not only when it comes to sexual touch or intimacy, those lovely ceremonies, sensual ceremonies, is at the end, it's everything. Yes. It's just to touch here, the sofa. It's yes. so beautiful, right? Isn't it? I it's look beautiful. At, it's very it's comfy. So here. Yeah, it's special. We're having a cup of tea, what we had before. Yes. I think it's this joy to embrace life. Yes. Um, how is manhood reacting on such a beautiful soul? Like, what is your... What was or what is your impression when, how were you perceived by men? Were some of them intimidated by that power, also that comes along with sensuality, or by that success, or by that, I speak up, I do my thing, I can do that. You said you made a transformation in your life. Again, I see you as a totally complete person, personality. Not only maybe for men, also for other women, it might be frightening, right? Yes, and it's something interesting. Before, I would say my other life and this life, which is like six years now and six years before when I was married. And I always was myself, but I had something in me that I needed to prove or to my husband or before to my father or my mother. I was always running from myself. When I was there, even if I would like say... Um, dress up or be beautiful or tell about my project, I would come with an energy that was stronger. Mm -hmm. For a reason where I went through all my huge transformation after I separated and I became to really understand how to flow and about the ego and all this, I calmed down. And it's funny, before men and women would be intimidated maybe. Some know, it depends what I would talk about because I never talk about like, I did this, I did the other. I'm telling you because you're asking me that. <laughs> But I really didn't want to do that because you can cause a lot of envy. Yeah. And um, So you take care of that. Yes. Yeah. I don't want to play with the egos. Like if they would ask me, my girlfriends from school, for example, what are you doing? And they would be interested and genuinely interested. I would say, yeah, I'm doing this and that, but I didn't want to really be asked because I felt like I was bragging and I, I didn't need that. I just wanted their heart and their warmth. And so I didn't really get off on that unless it was like I gave classes to and, and that. But um, what I mean now, when I talk to people, I'm more calm, more in peace with myself. This is the best example. I am a juror in a film festival called 
Premios Platino. It's like the Goya, but less. And I've been a judge for like eight years. And uh, when I used to go, and I'm a filmmaker, I would say, well, some people don't know me. Mm-hmm. And how, if I dress up, I'm tall, long hair, attractive, and whatever, they will think I'm an actress. And in that moment, actress didn't write. <laughs> now they do. So they will look at me and they would say, oh, she's stupid. Or she's like, she, she can't write. Or she, she's not a film director. Mm-hmm. But how can I be pretty and still prove to them that I am smart and I can do, I can produce and I can direct? So I would have a trouble with myself and I would like say, oh, I'm going to go tell them. And I'm going to say, hi, I'm the director from this and I can do this. And I, like pitch myself all the time. Now I go to the same place and I don't care. I don't care what I look like. I don't care what. I just believe on that connection I was telling you about, about the intention that my spirit will bring the right spirit to talk mm-hmm. to me. And I, if my spirit is and I have a project that has a good soul and I want to do it, it'll just connect me. And of course, I'll talk about it. But it's not like a the end, uh, the, it's not the reason why I'm going to the festival to tell them about my stories. I am going and I will pitch, but it's okay if it doesn't happen. So my ego or my A, A plus personality has changed. I'm just in peace with the present and just being there. Just being, even if I stand alone in a corner, I'm not embarrassed. But before I was, I was like, oh my God, they're going to think I, I'm not talking to anybody or... So now it's just like, it's okay. Everything, it's okay. It do, just doesn't matter. It's not personal. So it's, it's delicious. It's delicious. So I, I really want to share that with people that, you know, calm down. It's okay. Don't prove anything to anybody. Of course, I have a beautiful dress and I have my <laughs> extensions and everything because, you know, still I it's like, <laughs> where's the feminine and women? And I want to look beautiful. Yeah. This feminine and masculine game or play is a beautiful one, right? It is incredible. Oh, it has so much energy. It's a pity because in Europe or in Germany in particular, I have the idea, this is what I know, that it has stopped a bit because of this Me Too and uh, men feel very insecure, I think, these days. Yes. What is the right compliment? Is it right to give a compliment? At least from where I come from. And I personally view it as it is important because this is our energy. There are genders around in my book. <laughs> I view it like this. It's a pity because I really feel that, for example, in a film set, yeah. now it's very dangerous if they tell you something pretty, but at the, on the other hand, they also don't diminish you. So it, it is, we're in a transformation also, the world, you know. The whole world, right? <sighs> Oof. Oof. Because really, you know, I have never happened to me except when I filmed my, my opera prima. Mm. The DP told me, come on, sit in the dolly, and press the camera so they think you know. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I do know. I've been there. It's like, no, no, you have to show the crew that you can do this. And I'm like, don't worry. I'm so prepared that in a few hours they will know I can do this. And I was just thinking, why did he say that? I understand. Because probably this was 10 years ago, a woman director in Latin America. I'm the first one, you know, in Guatemala. So... It, it was kind of confusing. So, but now I think with the Me Too, they don't understand how to respect women or they, under, they do not understand how to, res, to, to act because it, they might like a woman and they will never say anything out of fear. But I think, and I've given a conference in the United States for women in film. It's called Women on Set in Miami. And they were all saying, oh, this happened to me, this happened to me, this happened to me. And I'm like, you know, we need um, a booklet for education because no one is educating men in a loving way because nobody educated the society respecting women until me too and like saying, no, you can You know, it's not like that. It's like, hey, how can we deal together with this you know it's like let's learn together but women are like learning on their own and men don't want to know about it so there's a big gap oh there's a huge gap there's a i think a huge potential to bring just more peace into this world just by working on that subject yes 
you see, there's so many retreats, everything for women, everything for this, all this mentoring, all this coaching, all this, this, and mostly it's women receiving this. What about men? They're going to stay where we were 10, 12 years ago, 15 years ago. It's a 15-year thing or 20. So there's more women alone. There's men that are just afraid and don't reach. There's more loneliness in life. I would even say that men suffer the same as women. At the end, 